finally, with Harald's final lecture. Um, so last time, I was close to the end of the proof of the main result for SL2. So as I was saying, I was proving that any set in SL2Z, Pz grows, as long as it generates a group. And as long as it's not as large as the entire group, of course. So we were in the middle of this. Let A generate, as I said, the group. For simplicity, we assume that A is its own inverse, that, it's, that it is that it contains all the inverses of, of its elements and that it contains identity. And so the conclusion is that either in a bounded number of steps, A grows by a power, or in a bounded number of steps, well, not even in a bounded number of steps, right away, really, let's just put it in the simplest way, in a bounded number of steps, you get something bigger than g to the o of delta. No. In fact, one can strengthen both of these statements. This one can replace by three, and this one can, in fact, one can in fact replace this by a cubed being already the entire group. No, but we will prove this marginally weaker version, which is more than strong enough for all practical purposes. And one can deduce these strengthenings from the version I'm giving you. At any rate, we were in the middle of the proof, or rather close to the end of the proof. What was, um, but the case we left for today was the most important one. It's when you have some pivots and some non-pivots in G. It's a typical induction step. So I remind you briefly that a pivot So it's a reminder. We call psi a pivot if this map going from A to T of K plus minus C, G of K modulo plus minus C. So which map? It's given by, well, it takes A comma T just to A psi T psi minus 1. So it's called the pivot. It's called the pivot if this map is injective. All right. So the induction case is what happens when you have that there exist pivots and non-pivots in G. As I said last time. In order to do induction, you don't really need an ordering, you just need generation. Because A generates G of K, there is going to be some some pivot in G, or rather, some non-pivot in G and some A in A, such that Psi is not a pivot, but Xi is a pivot. No. In general, whenever you have a set that is not empty and not the whole group, and you have A generating the group, some, that you are going to have some element of the set that is taken out of the set by the action of that element of A. Very well. So, um, since Xi is not a pivot, as we saw last time, this implies that there are so last time I will refer to this from last time that there are many elements of psi t psi inverse in A4. Uh, very well. Um, But at the, same, at the same time, Xi is a pivot. So 
So this means that phi xi is injective. So as usual, you have that, you consider. So we're going to consider what? Hmm? Xi, yes, phi x, ax, yes, ax, phi ax, exactly. So, all right, so it's going to be injective on the elements of the torus when you have a here and you ha when you have the torus a xi t xi inverse here. Oh, intersection, we say k if you prefer. So here it's going to be injective. So its image is going to be at least one fourth a a for xi t xi inverse, where the four just comes from the modulus here. And this is at least a constant times a to the 4, 3, minus O of delta, simply by this. And so you are done. Because this is, of course, the xi is going to be... So, yes, and um, uh, what, were, what do we have? Yes, so all of this, all of this map is going to be contained in... Um, did I... So this is correct, right? Um, oh, the way I defined it, I really mean, um, I really mean this, excuse me. So, so x size pivot, this is good. So, I've really written simply this way, excuse me. I wrote out the definition of phi xi. Yes. And of course, this is at most a to the 7, because all of these elements are in this is intersec intersection. We can, so we can see it from this perspective. Um, and a, k was just, um, well, it doesn't matter. k was just 4, I think. So. This way, this way I wrote 7, so it's fine now. Um, so we have that a to the 7 is, uh, size at least, a to the 4, 3 minus O of delta, and we had a, so we have growth. We had a contradiction to the assumption that there was no graph, and we are done. All right, so much for SL2. And the same ideas that I have presented, so it is the, a contemporary proof, if you wish, an updated proof, that is streamlined and that is also generalizes more easily. It's, uh, to higher rank groups. No, so the same ideas apply and give you gro uh, growth in SLN, in SON, and so on. Now, as I said last time, um, there is a sticking point still there in that there is a dependence on N that really is there for results of this type, but that shouldn't be there in the consequences. Those problems are tied up with the fact that no useful diameter bounds were known for symmetric groups and are until rather recently. But now they are known, so we have some hope to advance. So let me devote the rest of today's talk to the symmetric group. I will not, so th this has been proven three or four times right now, so the proof has become shorter. Um, I cannot yet give you a full proof in one hour or 50 minutes for CIMEN, but I will try to give you several of the key ideas of the proof. So giving a second proof of this is a difficult exercise for the audience. Uh, so, close an outline. All right, so what was the previous bound known? So, CIMEN is just this group, with, it's, a, it's a group with n factorial elements. It's a group of all permutations of n elements. So what was known? So for G, C men, or really this was known for any for any subgroup. Any subgroup thereof, we will have that for any A that generates G. So this was known, this was Babai Sheresh from the late 80s. So it was known that the diameter 
of the group is bounded by, well, basically e to the square root of n log n. So this is, of course, very, very far from being a power of n. So what we showed was not a power of n. We showed something close to that, what's called a quasi-polynomial bound. So for g sim of n, or we can also show it for any transitive subgroup thereof. See, this bound is actually tight for non-transitive subgroups. Uh, this one four. It's not 19, 2019 yet. No. I don't have the power of prophecy, and even Annals does not take that long. Um, so for any transitive subgroup, so let me explain. So this result is actually tight for no, some non-transitive subgroups, because if you have a two cycle, a three cycle, a five, a five cycle, all these joints, then you will have something of huge diameter a cyclic group of huge diameter. So if you have a transitive subgroup, you can actually deduce it from this result, but using caveat, using classification. Whether you consider that moral or immoral is your choice, but I have to tell you. By a result from Baba and Sharesh, 92, using classification. So cl the classification theorem, by the way, is also the one that tells us that basically the two cases are the matrix group, the matrix groups, and semen. Uh, There's n basically nothing much else to study. All right. So for g in semen, as I said, g equals to semen, as I said, and any a g generating g, we prove that the diameter is what most e to the log n, so the four plus x. So as you can see, there's, there's a difference there. And this is this kind of bound that gets, that gets called quasi-polynomial. Um, now, again, I have to warn you again. Yes, the proof does use at one step classification, not just to obtain this corollary, but the proof itself. I don't like that. It would be very nice to have a proof without classification. And it would probably give three instead of four. And you, what do you get without classification at all? Uh, it don't, no, it's, uh, I don't get something in the sense that there is, uh, most of the proof does not use it, but there is one step that uses it. And if I knew how to do that step without classification, I would. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, uh, it could be that you still get something better than that. Well, I suppose one can. Sorry. <laughs> I imagine, but I, I haven't tried, and I, I, it would be depressing, I think, because it, everything would work out except for a detail. So I think it's, it's better to try to just replace that step so that it works well without classification. Because it's really a trick. It's a way to handle a special case. So some notation. Just, well, just to confuse some people and not to confuse others, um, the nomenclature for, ac for actions is different for symmetric groups, so people write x to the g instead of gx and x to the a or x to the h instead of for the orbit. They also write ax instead of the stabilizer of x and a. So, of course, then it's actually more intuitive People in symmetric groups always like to blame the Lambert for the other convention. Now, it's also important, there are two kinds of stabilizers. The setwise stabilizer, so that's when you stabilize the set as a set, as when you take it to itself, but you might permute its elements. And the point wise stabilizer. So, in the case of the, just so as to wrap one's head about, around this, in the case of the action of a group of its own on communication, the set wise stabilizer is a normalizer and the point wise stabilizer is a centralizer. Very well. 
So let me talk a bit about random walks, which are exactly what they sound like. You walk on a graph, taking a random decision at each step. But first of all, let me tell you what kind of graphs we'll be working with for the most part. You defined the Schreier graph, which is what, I mean, what many people prefer to call a multigraph in that repeated edges are allowed. The Schreier graph is not a graph that screams, rather you have that the set of vertices is just uh, x and the set of edges is x, xg, x in x, g in a. No? So uh, a Cayley graph is a special case of a Schreier graph. It's a Schreier graph for the action of a group on itself. So this possesses several of the nice properties of a Cayley graph. It's regular, connected if the action is transitive. And symmetric if, as is usually the case, a is a inverse, the, our usual convention. Very well. Excuse me. Yes. Is there a conjecture for what the, the upper bound should be? Yep. N to the O of 1, and we don't really know what O of 1 is. Some people believe it's 2 plus epsilon, but yes, n to the 2 plus epsilon would be the most optimistic conjecture. Already n to the log n would be very nice, which would be e to the log n squared. Yeah, yeah 3 would be nice, but not so nice. 2 would be nicer. So, uh, a little lemma. So what do we know about random walks? Well, a priori we know almost nothing. Almost nothing. Already, just because a graph is connected, well, for any connected regular graph, you can get a very, 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 very weak expansion type result. In the sense that you will know that lambda, the, that lambda 1, the, the eigenvalue that is, you know, that is not the one that corresponds to constant functions, is a bit bigger than 0, and moreover you can give a lower bound, a non-constant lower bound for lambda 1. So, and that turns out to be useful. So this is folklore. And, and that tiny gap leads to an upper bound on the mixing time. Regular, meaning every vertex has a greedy, connected, symmetric graph. The same properties as there. We send vertices. Meaning what? <clears throat> a case such that a random walk with at least k steps ends at any x with probability that is almost uniform. No, no infinity, in a very strong and infinity sense. So after these many steps, just a random walk, so you, you are dropped somewhere in Paris, you know nothing about anything, you start walking very randomly, and after enough time you will be a, a, every, anywhere in Paris with the same probability, without knowing anything about the map of Paris, even at the stage of giving the bound. So 
just let me say that if n were very large, this bound would be horrible, right? But this is very useful when n is not so large. All right, so what is the idea of the proof? Um, so let me tell you very quickly, how do you prove that there is uh, a non-zero uh, gap that you can actually bound, even if it's not a constant? So it's more comfortable here to work with the adjacency matrix. which is almost the same thing as the Laplacian, only without the subtraction. So, for f non-constant and real valued, and any r between the max and the mean of f, and s equal to the set of V, so vertices, for which the value of F of R is bigger than, F of V is bigger than R, you're going to have that the sum of A alpha over all vertices in S is a little smaller, really a little smaller, than the sum of just plain old F of V this is very easy to prove. It's just that your values over this set of privileged points get slightly contaminated by the, at least one guy from the outside. No? Because the graph is connected. It's using connectedness. And then the only thing we have to do is to apply this to any non-constant eigenfunction. You might say, well, eigenfunctions might be complex valued, of course, but because it's a symmetric gra uh, graph, the, um, the eigenvalues will be real valued and the eigenvectors, excuse me, the eigenvectors can be taken to be real valued in the sense that you can take combinations of eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue so that you work only with real valued eigenvectors. So you apply this and you have that <coughs> the adjacency operator makes any non-constant eigenfunction slightly smaller in a set, but, or in the, the sum of a set. But that means that the eigenvalue must be a little smaller than one. So that shows the gap. So it's a small, non-constant, let me emphasize, non-constant eigenvalue gap. And this leads, as we know, to a bound on the mixing time. So as I said, this is weak, but fortunately what you have for sym the symmetric group is that even though its representations have no spatial geometric structure, they do have a very interesting, they, they, you do have representations that are spatial in a sense, in that they are representations on sites that are much, much smaller than the group, non-trivial representations that are like that. So we apply this sort of thing to a, a Shire graph. It's useful when n, which is just the number of elements of x, is much smaller than g. So the example would be, in our case, just g acting on the elements 1 up to n, or on k tuples of distinct elements thereof.
<coughs> so let A be in C mem, A equals to its inverse, A three transitive. So it's an example of how to use this. this. It's a proposition to do by Bill Shadash. Space three transitive, I mean it acts transitively on three tuples. On three tuples of distinct elements, and you take a G in A that whose support is neither the entire thing or zero. Though this will be the conclusion will be interesting. It will be non smaller than n over three. So this was, this will tell you that you can do something interesting when the support of G is not all of n, and you know it's at most n over three. Though that can also be softened. Um, then. And we will also use some sort of epsilon. Then there is a G prime in A to the L, where L is not too large, sent to the 7 log n over epsilon, such that the support of G, oh, by the support of G, what is the support of G? I should have explained. It's just a set of elements moved by G. The number of elements moved by G. Uh, so this is at most three plus three plus uh, three one plus epsilon sub G. By the way, the 3 plus here is, is here because we want it to be there. It's useful, and in fact, I will sketch the proof briefly. I will just skip the detail of how to get this 3 plus. Excuse me. Is there, is there a G prime somewhere? Thank you. This is a prime. But sub G here. So as soon as sub G is, say, 1 fourth, or say if sub G is 1 sixth, this tells you that you, uh, sub G prime will be 1 twelfth. So it's... So it's a sketch of a proof. Well, the basic idea is this. So say that you have, let's call S the soup of G, for simplicity. So for sigma in c -man, we can define H to be what happens when you conjugate G by sigma. Support of H is going to be just S displaced by sigma, so sigma of S. And the support, this is a simple exercise of GH, will be a subset of S intersection S sigma, S section S sigma displaced by G, and S intersection of sigma S sigma displaced by H. So, the support, the size of support of GH is going to be at most three times the intersection of S and S sigma. And now what's the idea? If you pick sigma, if you could pick sigma just completely at random, then the intersection of S and S sigma would on average be how much? I asked well I oh thank you. So how much for sigma random, how large would the size of S intersection S sigma be? If I, all, all right, you are S. I now take a random permutation sigma, and I end up with S sigma. What is the, you are half of the room. What is the size of S intersection S sigma likely to be? People think this is too personal a question. Well, so you're half of the room, so S intersection, intersection S sigma should be of size about n over 4. Right? Mm -hmm. 
So for sigma truly random, so uniformly picked in cement, we would have that the size of S in the section of sigma is Sn times S. So your size is halved because you're half of the room. Now, can we see that? Can we see the proof of that statement in detail? Yes, and I will have to give it to you in detail in a few lines because we don't actually have sigma random. So I will actually have to do to show you that the the argument is uh, is based on just a very soft property of sigma that gets stimulated very well by a random walk because of this. All we need is that sigma takes any element to any other one with probability just about the same for any pair of elements. So. We don't really have these, but we have an, a substitute that is actually quite good because this expected value is the sum over all x prime and x of the probability that x be taken to x prime. And so, what is the probability for sigma? an outcome of random walk, <coughs> not of length infinity, but of a reasonable length. N, big N and, and D will be both be reasonable. They will be bounded by N, little n. So for the outcome of a random walk, what is its probability? <coughs> well, by this, the probability is about 1 over V, 1 over N, that is. This probability will be at least S or N. Very well. Phi Faulkner lemma. That's it. That's almost it. Of course, this gives you this gives you the result just assuming one transitivity and without the three plus here. But I will not go into the tricky details. So um, Yes, let me tell you what an immediate corollary of this is, which was a very useful result that was around before us, and which we do use to treat a special case. But what you should really take away from this is not just the result itself, or especially its corollary, but really the idea that some probabilistic proofs get mimicked very well. So because did we really want a random sigma? No, we just wanted to show that there exists a sigma for which this is true. Now, the probabilistic methods ever since Ardoz and company consist in saying, well, in order to prove that a, sigma, a good sigma exists, we pick a random sigma and we show that it's good with positive probability. So this is, this is the stochastic uh, version of the probabilistic method. You are not allowed to take a random sigma, as in any element of sigma with equal probability. You just take sigma as the outcome of, outcome of a random walk. And in, many, in some circumstances, it is just as good. This is the moral of the proof. So the corollary, so again, probably the Sheresh, is if you have A in cement, Conclusion, always remember to state the conclusion. Then the diameter is bounded by n to the eighth log n. Very well. Um, Baba once got upset when I uh, pointed out that he had put seven in his paper and it's really an eight, but it's, it's the same thing. So Proof, so apply the proposition, 
three of them, to G, and then you apply it again and again and again and you're done. To G, to G prime. You just bracket away. It's, because every time it, it gets smaller by actually much more than a constant factor because it's, it really decreases more than exponentially. You're done in no time. All right, so this is useful and it's also an example of the probabilistic method. So let me be like Rier, is the moral explicitly? Just with random walks. All right, let me tell you another story now. It has to do again with something that has been a leitmotif of this mini course, namely how to adapt results valid for subgroups and known for subgroups so that they are valid over sets, general sets. Just sometimes it will state it replace h by a and sometimes h by a to the k for some moderate k. So let me call this section large orbits and stabilizer chains. But the centerpiece really is the splitting lemma. So I will actually state the splitting lemma and give you the proof. I will state the splitting lemma in both its old and new variant, but I will just give you the old variant and then I will actually give the translation of the proof to you as an exercise, which you can now do, following a bit this model, user on the walk. So this is called Baba's splitting lemma, which is Again, just like Lars and Pink, this, um, Baba, in fact, here was working in the early 80s, back when it wasn't clear even whether the people who were doing classification believed that classification was done. So he was trying to, with some success, to give um, a, a much shorter proofs, to give much shorter proofs of some consequences of classification. And in the process, he showed the following. So let's have a two-transitive subgroup of cement, meaning a subgroup that acts transitively on pairs, and say you have some su subset of sigma, and assume that sigma splits a lot of pairs. What do you mean by splitting a lot of pairs? So assume that there are at least a possible portion, row of all pairs, for which end of pairs, just any pairs of distinct elements, such that sigma, so for a positive proportion of pairs, sigma separates alpha and b. What do I mean by separates? There is no g in the stabilizer of h with respect to sigma, the point wave stabilizer, with alpha g is equal to g. So it's what's called sigma separates. A and B. So this is evidently true by definition if sigma contains other A or B. But it can also happen that sigma separates A and B. For example, it could happen that this stabilizer is trivial, in which case it separates everything. But you could, it could also separate just something. Very well. And what is the conclusion? It's always good to have a conclusion. Then there exists a sigma H a sigma in H with that is not too large, just of logarithmic size, such that the point with stabilizer with respect to sigma to the S is trivial. So it's just the union, of course, of sigma to the G for all G in S. All right, so how do you prove that? So if you split a positive proportion of all couples, then a slightly enhanced version of yourself splits everything. So, let's point out first that if H is continuous big H, if G prime 
takes alpha to beta, then H e prime H inverse takes alpha H inverse to beta H inverse. That's tautology. It is a tautology, like all of math. Um, but what do we do now? So now we consider taking random things. H, H, taking at random, uniformly, H inverse takes alpha beta to any alpha prime, beta prime, with equal probability. Why? Simply because all cosets of a certain, of a subgroup are of the same size, that's the basic reason. But you could also say that this is intuitively clear. So the probability that um, H inverse takes alpha beta to some alpha beta, alpha prime beta prime, such that sigma separates alpha prime and beta prime is how much? So we know that sigma separates at least a proportion rho of all pairs. So the probability that, sig that H inverse takes alpha beta to some alpha prime beta prime that is separated is at least how much? It's at least rho. Very well. <clears throat> So, but at the same time, if this happens, if H inverse takes this, the consequence would be that no G prime in H sigma H takes alpha to beta. Um, meaning sigma H actually separates alpha and beta. Why? Simply because of what I said before. All right, so now let, let us do, let us choose a lot of random elements independently. Let S be a set of R random elements. <coughs> of H. So by the above, the probability that for every H in S, there will be some element in H sigma H, such that alpha G prime is in B. So the probability that for every H in S, sigma to the H will not separate alpha and beta, well, for every given element of S, it's just, it's, uh, the, it's one minus rho, but the probability that this never happens is just one minus rho to the dr. But this would hold, this looks like a very strong condition, so no wonder the probability is small, but this would hold if there were some g in H stabilizer sigma to the AS, because that g would be good for all, for all these purposes. <laughs> if there were a g prime in H sigma S, we alpha g prime equal to beta. So the probability the probability that this happens we have shown is small. So even the probability that this happens for some pairs is at most n squared days.
smooth and squared minus rho r. But this would happen, so if not true, if these things whose relativity were bounding were not true, then, well, what do you call an element that doesn't take any element to any other element? So what's its identity? So if your group separates everything, then your group is just, just consists of the identity. So all you have to do is set R large enough that uh, so the probability becomes and of course that's just constant times log n. So in that case, with positive probability, H sigma s is just identity, but if something ha happens with positive probability, it happens. Again, the probabilistic method. And so, there exists an S with of size R, of course, such that this is true, which is all we want. So that's it. It's a proof, due to Baba, uh, of this, using the, uh, the, a probabilistic idea. And now your exercise is just to translate this so as to give this, uh, the same result for sets. And then I will tell you briefly how this result gets used in the overall scheme of the proof. What would the, so I, will, I will give you the statement. So if A is in semen, assume as usual that A is on the inverse in A, A has been raised into transitive, sigma is some subset, and assume that there exist many pairs such that well, it's not a subgroup now, it's not A, it's A to the K1, where K1 is 9 and 6 log n uh, separates alpha and beta. Then there exists an S in A to the K2, where K2 is something like that n6 log n. Such that the point the point wise stabilizer of, of AA prime sigma s is the identity. And the S is of logarithmic size. So yeah, just translate this using a random word. Very well. All right, so how do you use this splitting lemma within the proof of growth in cement or of small diameter in cement? Because you see, the, actually, the, um, a result of type A times A times A is bigger than A to the 1 plus delta. That's not actually true over cement with delta constant. So this is an idea that goes back in part to Piver. Um, the concept of stabilizer chain, of building stabilizer chains, comes actually from the theory of algorithms over symmetric groups. The expression comes from, comes from sims, in fact, long before. 
So, all right. So what can you deduce from a conclusion like that one? That AA inverse, that the point wave stabilizer is identity. Well, just by pigeonhole, you have that. The only way that this can happen is for A to be bounded by N to the sigma S. And that implies that sigma is at least log A log N squared. So the assumptions then can happen only once sigma is already fairly large, not before. So the only way that your sigma will split, what the splitting lemma is telling you then, is that if sigma splits a positive proportion of all pairs, sigma must be pretty large. So when sigma is not yet very large, so when sigma is smaller than a constant, so let's find this to be L, log A over log N squared, there are less than the proportion of, of pairs split by A to the K1. So we're going to use that. We're going to use that for all sigma that are not very large, you are not separating a positive proportion of cell pairs. And in particular, you have large orbits. Because if you don't have large orbits, if every, if every orbit is of size most n over 2, then at least half of all pairs are separated. So. OK. So what do we do then? For any sigma, we obtain So first of all, there is some guy who has a long orbit, but even the point wave stabilizer of that, because it's just one point, it's going to have some l l l long orbit, you assume that. Then you consider the point wave stabilizer of alpha 1 and alpha 2, still of size much less than this, and so on and so on. Alpha L, such that alpha, and then you stop. Very well. There you stop, and this is what's called a stabilizer chain. So it means that using the splitting lemma, you show that if we say for A, you have any, really any set A that generates something too transitive and that is not tiny, you're going to be able to find a point with a large orbit. And then you're in the point with stabilizer of that, you're going to find some other element, which you can take to be the second one with a large orbit, say something like this. And then in the point with stabilizer of those two, you're also going to find some sort of large orbit, and so on and so on. And that's extremely useful. So let me show you some things that you can do that we, that you can do with that very quickly. So, yes, so the, an exercise is that then this implies that A prime L intersects. Uh, so A prime is just defined to be this. That A prime L intersects at least sigma L, L prime cosets of the point wave stabilizer contained in the set wave stabilizer. So just choose set to be a set of representatives. Then so 
what what are these representing? What what are these cosets? What what do the cosets of the set wave stabilizer and the point wave stabilizer look like? Well, the, the, you can just restrict them to sigma, uh, or to, rather to the com yeah, yeah. You, you restrict them to sigma, and they are acting on sigma, and they are giving you these many different elements of sim of sigma. So you you end up having in this way, if you, want, you can identify these elements to 1, 2, up to L, and what you have is that you have built a prefix, so you have that um, among the elements that fix 1 up to L as a set, you have almost all permutations of 1 up to L. So that's already the beginning of the light in this proof. And now that you have this uh, nice prefix, what can you do with it? Well. Cmen, sigma, and so in particular Z, acts on the point wave stabilizer by conjugation. So sigma here is first just alpha 1. I say of course, but I'm going to be slightly tricky. I'm not going to go up to alpha L, I'm going to go up to alpha L minus 1. Um, all right, so it acts on that by conjugation. But we know that the point wave stabilizer has a long orbit. Why? Because it was slightly tricky and I did not put alpha L minus 1 in sigma. Long orbit, namely that of alpha L. And, well, we can assume, as it turns out, that it acts like semen or Alton in it. In fact, you need much less than that. So, but warning, this is a step that uses the classification. Yeah. In fact, what we need is not really for, the, for it to act on semen or, or, or all ten like that. We just need to act, like we need to be able to assume that it acts like a two-transitive subgroup on that. Or even something a little bit stronger, namely that we, this is not obvious. We can find an S in the prime of constant size. So it, it is acting on this orbit. and. It, it acts, um, yes, it acts too transitively. On the long orbit, or almost entire long orbit. If you find a way to, to show this, and it's entirely plausible that, that, that it could be done without classification, excellent, publish it. It, so this acts. So on the line above, you want it acts like sim. So it's sim. Yeah, no, it acts like sim. Um, sim of uh, the orbit, or uh, sim m. Which is nice, whatever, it whatever it is. Sim or old. Yes. Mm. Very well. <clears throat> All right. Um, so now that you have something. So you just be, be being clever. You find a set of generators of at least a two transitive thing on that. So you have. On the one hand, um, yeah, uh, something in the point wave stabilizer that has just a couple of elements that generate something with a long orbit. And they're too transitive on that. And on the other hand, you have this pr long prefix acting on that by conjugation. So what do you get? Surprise, the orbit stabilizer theorem comes to the rescue. Because you have this tension between so what, what is going to be our action? So let's Z, let's Z act on S, or on, well, on the entire group really, but it acts on S by conjugation. So by orbit stabilizer, either there exists an element of G commuting with every, so an element of Z that is not the identity, commuting with S in S. But if it commutes with every element of H, it commutes with every element of the group generated by S. 
but the group generated by S is too transitive. And if you commute with a two trans uh, something that is too transitive on a set, you must be what on that set? Not you? Uh, yes, in Simen, if you commute with a two transitive subgroup, with every element of a two transitive subgroup, what must you be? So if you have enough elements that, you know, you will always find one that takes you to you, then uh, if you commute with that element, then you're not making a distinction between those two. If you commute with, and if that happens for all pairs, you must just be the identity. So G fixes every X in, long, in, the, in the long orbit. But the long orbit is long, so it means that G has small support. And then you use the result that I told, told you about, Baba Bill Sheresh. So the alternative is, of course, so either this happens or what happens? Or you're going to have a long orbit. So there exists an S in S. So in particular, because you're, you're doing this to S, there's going to be some element of So you're doing this to, to some K tuples, where K is the size of S. So you're going to, be, to have some S in S. Yes, by pigeonhole, the one with the largest orbit. I'm going to have some S such that this orbit is of size at least set to the one of S. So every tuple is taken to the different K tuple, and you know there's going to be some element of the K tuple that, is, that really moves around. But what does this orbit live in? So this is contained in A to the, well, whatever it is, N O log N stabilizing sigma. So this is contained in the point-wise stabilizer. So you have constructed a lot and a lot of elements because sigma is of size L factorial, basically, or rho to the L times L factorial. You have constructed a lot and a lot of elements in the point-wise stabilizer. And now, what can you conclude? You cannot conclude right away that you have rows, but you do have, because you might, maybe you already had a lot of elements in the point-wise stabilizer. But now, with the elements in the point wave stabilizer, where moreover you have a long orbit where things do generate something like C minor all 10, you can just recur. You can now work on that point wave stabilizer. And there you will find a long prefix, and there you will continue working and working. It gets messier, but this is the basic idea. So. So instead of having that, re of, re of really working by induction with a set A that grows, you, co you work with a stabilizer chain that, that grows. So then you have, you know, alpha 1 prime, alpha L prime, and so on. And yes. In fact, you have to repeat this step log times every time, so this does not get shorter and shorter, but it does work out. So this was a very brief sketch of the main argument. But I, what I really want you guys to take home with you is really this action of the setwise stabilizer on the point wave side. So once you get that this action is really moving things around, otherwise you use VBS, then you are building up a lot of things in the point wave stabilizer. That's what makes you win. So uh, I think that's it. And I think I've already stated uh, the main problem. So just to repeat one of them that was already mentioned, people actually believe that the diameter should be genuinely polynomial on n. It might even be n to the 2 plus epsilon. And some people believe that when you pick a random pair of generators of CMN or all 10, in fact, that should, that should give you or might give you an expander graph with probability arbitrarily close to 1. So that's it.
Yes. So how complicated is the use of the classification? I mean, is it a direct consequence? It's fairly direct. I mean, we use we use this. I mean, we, I don't even mess with it directly. There is a, a paper by Baba, by Baba and Sheresh that just shows you that the diameter. Uh, of a group with respect to any set of generators is basically bounded by the diameter of the largest symmetric or alternating factor. So that's the only way in which we use classification. Yes. Is anybody that you know working on trying to do this with SLN as it goes to infinity? So trying to combine kind of the two things. Uh, if, if, if somebody's trying, they are not telling me. Okay. Uh, but they might be trying. Yes. <laughs> well, if Serge were in the audience, he would say this is not a mathematical question. Yes, it's not a mathematical question, just to know. Working recorded. Please work on the problem, it's very interesting. So, you believe no more uh, mathematical or non mathematical? <laughs> so, thank you.